And now we're live, gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to Your Marketing Fix bi-weekly webinar. Sean Hart here with Seth Stevens and our special guest, Ray Hart, also known as my father, or Giveaway Ray. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello, folks. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I just gave Ray a, a quick briefing. He, he just walked into Seth's office there in Indianapolis. Uh, maybe five minutes ago, and I just told him about our webinar and basically about the uh, the three the three legs to any business. So remember, uh, what we're talking about here is business, past and present, and we like to break business down into three different legs. Uh, one leg you must have for any business is a product or a service to sell. Uh, we have to have leg number two would be your marketing message or sales pitch. And we also have to have a delivery system for that marketing message or sales pitch. So we're going to go through a little brief history here. Uh, we're going to talk about the tulip tree, and then we'll go into some some of Ray's past and, and his present business and try to break it down. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to take some of this, uh, some of the hacks from these what you learn here and plug it into your existing business today. Uh, and that's our hope. So, anything you want to add to that, Sasquatch? Nope, not yet. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, when I sent out the uh, the email about uh, like a tulip tree, everyone keeps asking me, what the heck is a tulip tree? So the expression like a tulip tree goes back to my grandfather, uh, also known as Pappy. Um, this is sort of a, a quick tribute to him, but he was uh, an inspiration in my life as well as Ray's life. And basically he was a handicapped gentleman who was my grandfather, uh, step-grandfather that is, and I grew up with polio. Uh, he had only had good use of one arm and one leg, uh, but it never really slowed the guy down. So he was a huge inspiration to me. Uh, we'll tell a few stories about him, but basically one of his famous sayings, and it made absolutely no sense. I don't even know to this day whether whether he knew what it meant, but you'd be talking to me and uh, <laughs> he's laughing just thinking about it. And one of Pappy's famous sayings was, like a tulip tweet. He had a little speech impediment, and people would look at him like, a tulip tree? What do you mean? So, yeah, just like a tulip tree. And, you know, for the life of me, I can never figure out what that was, but he used it in, in lots of different scenarios. Uh, can you remember one, Ray? Yeah, I do. We uh, were looking at a trailer, and I think you were there over in Milroy, and uh, this preacher had his trailer for sale, a little cargo trailer, and uh, Pappy was a wheeler dealer. I mean... He would never pay full price for anything. He had the wheel and deal, get the price down. And, uh, you know, he used that expression, well, you may be as smart as a tulip tree, but, uh, and uh, he would always use expressions. We loved old Pappy. And uh, he would use expressions like, well, you're half right. And, uh, you know, he would try to wheel and deal with the guy, and the guy would make a counter offer, and Pappy would say, well, you're half right. Yeah, really, man, he was half wrong, but he, he said he always got everything screwed up. Yeah. But he confused me. His own language, similar to you. <laughs> he would confuse people, and they didn't know where he was going from or coming from. And but he knew where he was going. He was going to to close the deal, but exactly. he, he did it in the weirdest way. And <laughs> because he was handicapped, he never asked for sympathy. Well, not too much. I mean. When a cop wanted to give him a ticket, <laughs> cop wanted to give him a ticket, he would show him his uh, his bummed out arm and leg because he had polio. Mm -hmm. His arm was bent up like this, and his leg. And he hopped 325 pounds, probably what he weighed. Hopped mm -hmm. around on one foot. But when a cop would stop him, he would move his arm around so the cop would see he was polio. Ask for a little sympathy there, but oh, I was with him one time. He got pulled over for speeding, and he said, uh, "He said, sir, why are you going so fast?" And he goes. Well, to tell you the truth, officer, I, I got a shit. <laughs> <laughs> he got a ticket that day, and he was he was pretty serious about it. But I remember <laughs> a couple of scenarios when he would just embarrass the heck out of people. He was trying to buy something, you know, and and of course, anytime Pappy was selling something, the price, you know, it was worth a million dollars. But anytime somebody else was selling something, it was a pile of crap until until he had title to it. And he sit there and looked a guy right in the face one day talking about a price, and he said. Now listen, sir. I might not be ignorant like you are. 
and he got away with it. People just thought, man, this guy is crazy, and they'd give him what he wants. So, yeah, he, he got the job done. He was such an inspiration to me. There's an old saying, um, I felt sorry for myself because I had no shoes until I met the man who had no feet. And all of a sudden, your problems don't look so big. Well, his son, how I, Pappy entered our life and our family, my best friend as a kid, mother, uh, married Pappy. So that's why Sean said it's his step-grandfather. It's not my blood. And my best friend, he didn't really see the value of having a father. And I didn't have much of a father. I had a father. But uh, to this day, I can't think of anything he ever taught me. Nothing. I mean, nothing. But Pappy, uh, his name was Jim Leisure. Pappy, I didn't call him that because they had kids then, but he was Jim. But I used to love to hang around with him because he had good work habits. Every day, this 325-pound man, one-legged man, would hop through a frame house. I'd stay all night over at my best friend's. It became Sean's Uncle Ted. Sean wasn't in the picture yet. But I would stay all night there. I'd wake up like, boom, boom, boom. The house was shaking. At about 7 o'clock in the morning, I was Pappy getting out of bed, hopping to the bathroom. And he'd go in there and do his business. And he'd get shower, shave, and hop back to the bedroom, get dressed. Then he'd hop to the kitchen table where uh, his wife would fix him breakfast. And it you can set your clock by it at eight o'clock. Hop, hop, shaking the house to the front door, and out the door immediately to his car to go to work. He had a car lot. He, he was a car salesman in the wintertime, and he ran a carnival in the summertime. And I helped him work on the carnival. What an inspiration he was at 8 o'clock, and that was six days a week. And on Sunday, he was sleep in. And, uh, but this was my time to hang around with him was about noon Sunday, he'd have a truckload of trinkets in the back of his car, and we'd go out and sell stuff, buy stuff. So I just loved hanging out with him. And I couldn't get my best friend, which was his stepson, to do that. He didn't enjoy him at all. I loved him. And he was just an inspiration. I mean, uh, and he would come back every night. He would leave at 8 in the morning and work till 10 at night or 11 and pull in the house. You know he had to be tired just if he was in good health. What was his, what was he doing? He was out selling. And he would come home. He only had, he had his left hand and he had a shirt pocket full of checks or contracts or both. And he kept his cash and checks in there. He'd always come home with a pocket full of checks. Every night, you know, he was just a working fool six days a week. And then Sunday, he slept in a little bit, but he went out and worked Sunday afternoon. That's when we saw him do the trailer thing where he talked about his tulip tree, and he might be ignorant, <laughs> but that was happy. So we give him a lot of tribute. He was an inspiration to me and Sean, and whether he knew it or not, not, you know, I mean, I always recognized him as that. He helped a lot of people out. He had a big heart. He'll clean your clock when he sells you something, and then he turn around and give it away in charity to somebody else. So yeah, he was exactly. more like a Robin Hood, rob the rich, give to the poor. He took a little commission off the top. <laughs> I'm having a, a little technical difficulty with my camera, but I'll get it fixed. But uh, you guys can still hear me okay. Uh, someone keeps trying to call in, and I didn't turn off all the all the bells and whistles on my uh, on my computer here. So hopefully I can get it working again. Anyway. Uh, one of the things that I remembered about Pappy is, you know, he would always take a bad situation and, and turn it into something positive. Uh, I remember uh, I wasn't there, but uh, you know, he he traveled with the carnival a lot and had had a lot of a uh, lot of connections there, and that's one of the ways he liked to go out and hustle his living. But I remember him telling the story one time about spinning cotton candy. You, you remember those stories? Oh yeah, I got. I don't know if you know this, but th I own that cotton candy machine. It's 80, probably 70, 80 years old. I still have it. I end oh. up indirectly. That oh, was no, I, I have no idea. Yeah, that's Pappy's. I got Pappy's cotton candy machine. That man would stand on one leg with one hand and spend cotton candy. You know, standing up, a quarter of a stick, cotton candy on a stick. He'd spin it. 
And he'd try to get in and put in a little hole to hold it, but he'd spin it and take that quarter and make change. And sanitation wasn't a big deal with him at that time, you know. <laughs> he didn't wear gloves or anything. He just took the quarter, hand the cotton candy, spin the cotton candy, hand get the quarter. But uh, I seen him do over a $1,000 a day at a quarter at a time. That's a lot of money. And, and not take a break the whole day. Not take a break. I don't know how he held his stuff, if you know what I mean, but he did. <laughs> That's funny. Well, one of the one of the memories I remember of uh, Pappy doing his cotton candy gig, he said one time he was doing some company picnic or state fair or something like that, and then said he he ran out of flavors, and you know basically cotton candy is just colored flavored sugar, um, you know melted sugar. He said he had a little bit of this, a little bit of that left, but at the end of the day, you know, it was only a, a spoonful of each flavor. So he said he mixed it all together. He said the cotton candy come out looking brown like shit. He said that's all he had left, but the only thing he could think of is, what, what flavor is this? And he said, you know what? This is a brand new flavor. This is what we call root beer. And he said he just kept on selling. <laughs> no shock me. In cotton candy, you're supposed to mix a powdered flossine with, with the sugar. Well, it was a pain in the butt to go get the flossine. It wasn't something readily available in a grocery store, but you could get sugar anywhere, and you could get food coloring anywhere. I've never seen a man do it before or after. He would mix liquid food color to color the sugar, and that was his cotton candy. That was his, that was his coloring. It tastes like sugar, because that's what it is, sugar. <laughs> but had no other flavoring to it. But in pickle, he would use uh, liquid food color. He was quite an inspiration. He was a get things kind of done kind of a fella. He, uh, I told my best friend, I said, man, we ought, to, we ought to tag team here with Jim, which later became Pappy, uh, because we could turn this carnival into a great big carnival, a big one. It was just a little bitty thing, rag bag thing. But my best friend had no interest in it. So at age 11, uh, I kind of left Pappy. I worked with him when I was like 8, 9, 10, 11. And then at age 11, I went with a full-time professional, really big organization. You know, I mean, I started affiliating with, I'll call them, Pappy was a professional, but I would say more professional, a little bit more polished. But it all started with him. He was kind of like, I, I, I relate to him as my first real father figure in my life. Uh, right. Like I said, I had a dad, but he didn't teach me anything. He didn't even spend any time with me to speak of. So Pappy's main business was a carnival that he started then? Yeah, he owned a carnival, and uh, he sold cars in the summer, and I mean cars in the winter and worked the carnival in the summer. He uh, hopped his way through college. He got a bachelor's degree um, at Franklin University. I don't even know if Sean knew that. but. Yeah. Uh, he hopped his way through there, got his uh, bachelor's degree, and uh, so he's a pretty motivated fellow. He had a little speech impediment, and he might have not been hitting on all eight cylinders, at least not at the same time, but uh, he got he got the job done. He would get out and see people. He would sell people, and uh, of all things, he was an inspiration to me, my first inspiration. All right. Yep. That's that's the way I remember it myself. So. Anyway, uh, that's like I said, that's just a, a tribute to Pappy that I wanted to share and, and uh, you know let you know how important he was in, in my early development. Talking about a, a handicapped guy who used to work 16, 18 hours a day, never complained about it. And uh, basically, it was all about the deal with Pappy. Every time, you know, he, he would do whatever it took to chase the dollar. You know, I'd seen him drive to, to Georgia in the middle of the night to buy a couple hundred dollars worth of little throw rugs and bring them back and pedal them out of his truck. You know, and this is a guy that drove around, and he'd pull in your driveway and blow the horn to get you to come out so he could pitch you because he couldn't get out of the car. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He'd pull up in the driveway, start start blowing the horn until finally somebody would come out. What the heck is this idiot doing? And then he'd say, hey. <laughs> you know, then he'd pitch you the, pitch you the product, so. Definitely, uh, definitely a winner, a go-getter, and you know he didn't really know the meaning of quit. So, um, anyway, I'm sure uh, you've had some inspiration like that in your life too, haven't you, Seth? Yeah, not not quite as a, as a good of an example though. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> the iceberg. 
Yeah, definitely the tip of the iceberg. But the root beer, cotton candy for me said it all, you know. I would have given up and went home, but yeah. mix it all together and it comes out shit knuckle brown. He calls it root beer and goes on. <laughs> and we got to tell us, son, we got to tell the story about the lifesavers. This is a good one. Yeah, it's actually in my notes. <laughs> oh, is it? yeah. Well, he would, uh, when we tell the story, I'll let you tell yeah, us. Go ahead. It's hilarious. I'm still trying to fix my camera. Uh, he had a he had a good friend named Wayne Chandler, and uh, he's since gone. Uh, older man, he was old when I was a kid, so I know he'd be a hundred something now. But I'm getting old. Um, but uh, now this falls on the line of a con artist, but I can't help it. It's something. It's something funny. But they would him and Wayne would talk to a homeowner, and they would tell them they had a new. Um, toiletry sanitation chemical that would clean their toilets and make it sparkly clean. And what they did was they'd buy a nickel. I know it's hard to believe, but lifesavers used to be a nickel for a big roll of lifesavers back in the horse and buggy days. But um, him and Wayne would take a white lifesaver and they would talk people into letting them see their toilet. They would get to the toilet. Now, Pappy would have to hop in there. Can you imagine a 325-pound man hopping into a little bitty bathroom? And what they would do is under the ring of the toilet, where usually people take a, a scrub brush to knock it, you know, to clean it up. So anyway, what they would do is they would take their finger, their index finger, Pappy Wood or Wayne Wood, and they would run it around the rim underneath that toilet, you know, the part you can't see, a little overhang. And there would be gunk up there. There would be calcium and lime and God knows what else was up there. But they would knock that loose with their finger. They'd say, well, this, this special chemical, we have this special tablet, which was nothing but a lifesaver, would knock, would, uh, and they'd say, there's a lot of germs and bacteria up here in this room, and they were knocking it loose with their finger. Then they would say, now we take this tablet here, we drop it in the toilet, and then they'd flush the toilet. Now that crud would come loose and say, see? See all that crud going down the toilet? Now, use your logic. The water in the bottom of the toilet flushed out. It didn't go up to that part, you know, but... They did it anyway, and they sold this as a miracle toilet sanitizer. <laughs> Can't help it. They, they were a little bit, they had some carny in them, if you'll, you understand what I mean. Sean ribs me a lot about being a carny, because I was a carny, but Pappy got me started in that business. And I, I saw the business that was there, and I decided to go, and I became an actual professional. We don't call it carny anymore. We call it showman. <laughs> I became a professional showman. And that's what I was. And that's what salespeople are. We're show people. We're salesmen. We're, we're actors. We're showmen. We're, we've got to show our product. We've got to find a way to put on a nice dog and pony show and explain the benefits of our, of our product or our service and then why they should buy that. So I did get my start from being in show business as a showman. Or did, you, did you ever sell any lifesavers? No, I didn't do the <laughs> lifesaver thing. No, I didn't. But I, I know that's a true story. I know, yeah. I, I know it's true. <laughs> I've heard him tell it in front of lots of people that were involved in it, and uh, everyone seemed to like it. So I actually mentioned it. It's kind of funny. Of course, it's it's a con, but it just shows you what a guy's willing to do. You know, if he, if he can just get out of bed and hop to the car in the morning. Yep. Boy, so, eight o'clock. He was hopping to that car. <laughs> so this is to you, Pappy. Uh, he's no longer with us now. He's been gone since about what two thousand and three or four or something like that. And, no, uh, I think, that I think uh, time flies. Seems like, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, it's probably been about 2004. He's been gone a while and we miss him, but this is to you, Pappy. So let's uh, let's move forward there, guys. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Ray here and some of his past experiences. Um, Basically, uh, I wanted you to tell a little story about uh, about your door to door sales and and how that how door to door sales is instrumental in teaching you about people and how they react to offers and how to appeal to people because you know Seth and I were of the new age even though I sort of cut my teeth doing door to door face to face sales 
Uh, right now, Seth and I are in remote marketing. I mean, we see like 0.0000% of our customers. Right. And, you know, back in the old days, in order to get somebody to part with their money for an offer, it was about face-to-face -face contact, you know, handshake, toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose type stuff. So tell a little bit about that, how you got involved with that and uh, how that affects what you do today. Keeping in mind that in my, in my email, uh, one of the headlines that I used was with a haircut and a necktie, I believe you can be somebody. Yeah, I remember that day. Well, in my carnival <laughs> days, um, I went from being a con artist to actually being a salesman and right at the tail end of it. Now you were just in diapers, Sean. And, uh, I mean, really thanks literally, what's that? I said, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. But anyway, um, Another carny, he needed some money, and he hawked me some stuff. He hawked me some uh, leather stamps where you, like, make belts and waistbands and bonnets and leather belts and things, put their name on it. And he needed some money, so he hawked me. He borrowed some money, and he goes, I don't want you to just give it to me. I want you to hold this equipment that was worth thousands of dollars and he needed 500 bucks or something. I don't remember the number. It doesn't matter. But he said, now I'll teach you how to use it, and I'll pay you back in about 60 days. So he taught me how to make leather belts and little name and key chains and stuff. And I found out there I became an honest man, uh, <laughs> a real honest man. I found out that people like to see their names. That's egotistical type thing. Like when we all take a group photo, who's the first picture we look for in that group photo? Ourselves. Well, people like to see their names on belts and keychains and different stuff. So he taught me how to do that. And I went from being a con man to, because most carnies or showmen, when we work what I did, you, the odds are about 10 million to one you're going to win that little teddy bear up there. But I, I made you think it was going to be easy, but it wasn't. But bottom line, I found out if you give something, you give people something for their money, they'll give you their money if you give them something they like. And that's what sales is all about. You know, find a, a need and fill it. So what I did is uh, I made belts and purses and sun bonnets and all kinds of stuff. And then when that 60 days came up, that guy said, hey, you know what, Ray, I really don't want that stuff back. If you want it, you can have it. I know it's worth two or $3,000. I only owe you a couple hundred, but if you want it, go ahead and keep it because I don't want to do it no more. So I started doing it, and I really liked it. I found it so easy to get people's money if you gave them something they liked and wanted, and people do like to see their names, just like their pictures. So that kind of was my turning point. And then that winter when I went home, I had a friend of mine that used to work for me on the carnival. I used to have a lot of employees working for me, depending, you know, anywhere half a dozen. But in the wintertime, he sold vacuum cleaners. So uh, I looked him up. He lived about 50 miles from our hometown. So I went up there to see him. And uh, he was getting dressed and putting on a suit and tie. He goes, man, it's good to see you, Ray. He says, I ain't got time to talk right now. If you hang around a little bit, I got to go on a sales appointment. Uh, we'll go out and, you know, have a good time tonight, you know, and do what we used to do. We we're party animals. And um, so he goes, I've got an appointment to go sell a vacuum cleaner. And uh, he says, I'll probably make $100. And I'm probably going to sell it. If you want to go with me, I'll give you half the 100 Well, at that time, I had about a zero account in zero money in my account, so 50 bucks sound like a million. I said, well, sure, why not? He goes, well, you have to wear this. And he threw this long green snake at me. And uh, he said, you'll have to wear this. And he threw a necktie at me. I still own that necktie to this day. I wouldn't take a thousand bucks for that necktie. This is 40 years ago. I still got that necktie. Um, he died a long time ago, my friend did. But I didn't know how to tie it. So he put it on his head and tied it, loosened it, took it off his head, put it on mine, put it on my shirt, tightened it up. Now I had a polo golf type shirt like this, not a button down shirt, and it was plaid. 
and he had a green necktie and I had blue jeans on. And we went out and he did a presentation to a vacuum for a vacuum cleaner in about an hour. Lady paid him for the vacuum cleaner. We walked outside. He handed me 50 bucks. I said, wow, thanks, man. I didn't do nothing. He just gave it to me. He said, do you think you could do what I just did? And I said, yeah, I think I could. He says, well, he said, uh, you need to meet my boss. So he introduced me to his boss. His name was Dave Hensley, which I owe him a lot, too. And Dave said, you know something, kid? I think with a clean shirt, a haircut, and a necktie, you could be a somebody. I said, me? He said, yeah. You know, you could be a somebody. You know, get a clean shirt, a haircut, a tie. So you want to join us? And I said, well, let's do it. And he goes, all right, jump in. So we jumped in this Cadillac, went down to the barber shops. There went the hair. Still there, I think. <laughs> uh, there went the hair. We went to a Goodwill store, spent 20 bucks on me, uh, bought me some used clothes, a used jacket, a used tie, a used shirt, and I looked like a Philadelphia lawyer. And we went <laughs> on, and, uh, I mean, I was dressed sharp. Never wore a tie in my life until that day. That's funny. So, we uh, went to learn the business. Here's what we did. I didn't know what the word lead, L-E-A-D. I didn't know what a lead was. Didn't know what it was. Um, I'd never been in sales. I'd always been in show business. Mm. And, uh, so he said, now what I want you to do, I want you to go up to that door. And he, we pulled up to a farmer's house out in the country in the rural area. He goes, I want you to go up to that door, and here's what I want you to say. He says, I want you to say, hello, my name is Ray Hart. I'm with the Silver King Company. And I just stopped by to see if anyone from our company had stopped by recently to get your opinion on the new Silver King. You would hope they would say, what's a Silver King? And then you would say, oh, well, that's what we're giving this free gift away for. You get your choice of this umbrella to put behind the door here for a rainy day or this leather bound telephone address book that you could put by your telephone. Which gift, here was the first close, which gift would you rather have? And you shut your mouth and let them talk. And they would say, well, I'll take the umbrella, but I'm not buying anything. Oh, no problem, you don't have to buy anything. I just wanna get your opinion. So I hand them the umbrella, then I waved at my buddy Dave and he come walking in with a bunch of boxes and his demonstration kit with the vacuum cleaner. And what he taught me basically was knock on doors. That's I knock on the door. You uh, dig dirt. You do a demonstration. If you've ever had a vacuum cleaner salesman in your home, they, they pick up dirt out of this, dirt out of it. They put little pads around showing you the dirt that your old vacuum cleaner left behind and how your new one that you're demonstrating does a great job. And then you pass the order book, close the sale. So he taught me, get a haircut, clean shirt, tie, knock on doors, dig dirt, pass the order book. And the thing that you learn from all this, if you have to boil it down right now at this point in the interview here, is that it's all all sales and you can apply it. You geeks can apply it. Seth's a geek. Sean's a geek. I'm not a geek. I don't know how to spell geek. I don't even know how to spell www but I know you guys do that are watching this. But sales is all about a numbers game, whether you're doing it on the internet, whether you're doing it door to door, whether you're doing it store to store, floor to floor, or whether you're working at a carnival, a flea market, a, 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 a county fair, wherever, it's all about numbers. The more people that walk by you, if you've got a physical display, the more people walk by you, not all of them is gonna buy, but you want to get as many people walking by as you can because occasionally one of them is going to buy. On the internet or a website or a, if you got a website, the more people you get to visit your website, do they all buy? No. But if you get a lot of them, some of them will buy. So it's a numbers game. It boils down to numbers. I, I know you geeks count how many hits. I don't even know how to spell hit, but you call them hits. we got so many hits on my website. Am I saying that right? Well, we have impressions and page views. I think that's like a similar to a door for you. Okay. So you guys talk geek. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically we can uh, knock a lot more doors and dig a lot more dirt and pass a lot more order books virtually. 
<laughs> yeah, you do it virtually. However, so, Ray, one thing I was going to you know, maybe mention was, have you ever done anything more with the personalized products? I guess you know you have a personalized sales pitch normally since you're in person, but did you ever, you know, you mentioned personalized belts and, you know, different things that you're making, but you said people like their name. Do you ever you do anything else with that? Uh, yes, sort of. Um, I had other products later. Now, I, I really got specialized at first, and that's all I did was vacuum cleaners. That's all I did. And then, um, a long story as short as I can, and, Sean says, uh, I say I paint word pictures. Tell them what you say, son. Oh, uh, yeah, he paints word murals. <laughs> well, I went from doing vacuum cleaners when Sean was in diapers, and uh, then I got the insurance business. And, um, and i tell you what the insurance business did to me. Um, it really made me super honest, super honest, because I had to get a license, I still got it in my wallet now. Sold some today. Um, we're talking over 35, 36 years ago. Um, it may be regulated because insurance, I may, y'all may hate insurance, but it is highly regulated. And that could crooks get into business? Yes, they could, but they could go to jail too and lose their license and pay a fine. But insurance got me regulated. And uh, so I did that a long, long time. And now when Sean went, went from diapers, now fast forward, um, probably one of the greatest ideas I ever came up with, I'm kind of didn't answer your question, Seth, but one of the greatest <laughs> we came up with, here's part of the- It yeah, won't be the last time, Seth. <laughs> uh, I made a note of it. I didn't know how to spell the word silk screen. I mean, I'm kind of a dummy, um, but I, I didn't know how to spell silk screen, but I got this idea. I don't even remember whether it was my idea or your idea, Sean, or we stole it from somebody else. We probably stole it from someone else. Probably because I'm not very smart and you're dumber than me. There's but, nothing uh, new. What's that? There's nothing new. All we do is uh, right. we, we don't innovate. We duplicate and we try to make it better. Well, somehow we came up with this clever idea, whether we made it, come up with it, or we stole it. But it didn't have a name back in those days, but it has now. And we're talking many years ago when Sean was 18 years old. We came up with the idea. Um, Just for the record, that was about seven years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the only time he lies um, about his age. But anyway, we came up with a – we were the pioneers of the bandit sign. So I got Sean to go to school and get a license. So he became a licensed insurance agent at age 18. Now, let me, let me just, while you're painting your mural, I want to put a wide stroke out there for you. Uh, what he's getting at now is the marketing message and more importantly, the delivery system that we used at that point. Because that was my next question. Where did your LEADS come from? So what is his product was health insurance, life insurance. I was there. Um, the marketing message was, what did your sign say? Tell me. Lowest, lowest cost health insurance, uh, free quote, 800 number. No, no, no. It was lowest cost health insurance, 1-800-467-2030. That's what it said. Yeah, he's got, he's good number. We but only hung 4,000 of them. Almost five. <laughs> uh, he's not joking. Um, I went to a printer. I went. I called several of them back when we used telephones. Now, I still do. You guys text and use the internet. But back in the horse and buggy days, I contacted several printers. They're called silk screen printing. I didn't know what it was. I just heard the term. But I, some, I told somebody what I wanted, and they said, well, we can silk screen that. I don't care how you do it, just do it. I want a thousand signs. Oh no, that's a big order. That's gonna take six months. That's gonna take six weeks. That's gonna take three months. I didn't wanna hear that. One thing you'll learn about me, and if you wanna learn about me or Sean, we wanna get it done. Now, Sean, I always tell people about Sean. Sean wants it done yesterday. Today's okay with an apology. 
tomorrow, forget you, he's done moved on to another person or another project. We want her done now. I'm that way too. But he's more organized than I am and educated. Now, what we did, I went to, I caught somebody smoking cigarettes behind the print shop, the silk screen print shop. And I said, hey, is it hard to silk screen? He goes, no, I've been doing it for years. And I said, well, I'll give you 20 bucks if you show me how to silk screen. He goes, huh? Well, yeah, he put a cigarette out and we went in back in the back door of the print shop. He educated me in about 10 minutes how to silk screen. And uh, I said, well, how can I get one of them silk screens made? He goes, well, it costs you about $25, $30. I can make you one. I said, oh, where can I buy that ink at? He told me. And what kind of ink to buy and where to buy it at? And I said, where can I buy one of them squeegees? He said, well, the people that sell the ink will sell you the squeegee. So I said, when could you have me a silk screen made? He goes, probably by tomorrow. So we bought the silk screen. And he, if you don't know what silk screen is, Google it. Ah, how do you like that fancy word? Google it. But <laughs> it, made, it made us a silk screen. And we went out and I borrowed a buddy of mine's brother's barn at 32 degrees now that, or 33 degrees i'm sorry 33 degrees we got in this barn and we set up this jig and this silk screen and i bought this substrate that's another fancy word but it means stuff you print on and uh, i bought a whole skid load of it had it cut to the right size i did all this in like 48 hours and uh, uh, my kids helped me <laughs> And we put the silk screen or put the substrate in there, drop the silk screen down, run the squeegee. In about three and a half seconds, we had a big sign. What size was they, Sean? About 18 by 24? Uh, 16 by 20. 16 by 20. Um, and almost 5,000 of them, we did it in one day. <laughs> a day. Now, everybody else said it's going to take six months to do 1,000 of them or three months or six weeks. We did it and didn't know how to do it, but we did it anyway in a day. Now, I got my kids to help me, and uh, they were my kids. They're still my kids. Now, they're big kids now. But hired all their friends, everyone we could draft. We had about 20, 25 people in that barn. We could make the signs faster than they could find a place to put them up to dry because that was important. They had to dry. The ink had to dry. And what was weird about it, it was 33 degrees. Something happens at 32 degrees for you people in the deep south don't know what that means. It means liquid freezes. <laughs> so we had to hurry up and get it done before it froze. We just kept praying all day it would stay 33 degrees or better. It never got warmer, but it never got colder. We made over 4,000, almost 5,000 signs that day. And then we went out and plastered them. I put it in everybody's car and I gave them a hammer and these nails and we plastered them all over Indiana. Yeah, I think some of them are still hanging. There's not much left of them. <laughs> I did see one last year and I've been about, well, you were 18. I also figured it out. That was uh, 22 years ago for you, man. Seven, seven years ago. Seven years ago. 22 years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, we got. Sometimes 60, 70 leads, people call that 800 number, 60 to 70 leads a day. Not now it's getting juicy, Seth. Yeah. What did you say? <clears throat> I said, now it's getting juicy. Oh. Well, that was our delivery was making the signs, putting the signs out there, and the phones were ringing, 60, 70 leads a day. The one company that was my primary company, we became their top producer, and uh, it was easy to hire salespeople because I had leads for them. I had leads for them to go on. Now I got to brag, I got to toot Sean's horn. Sean was my top salesman, 18 year old, pimple faced, tall, skinny kid. Uh, kind of hurt a little <laughs> uh, But anyway, people felt sorry for him, not really. He would take those leads, and Sean just magically came alive. When they would call, he would qualify them. He would ask them questions. He would write it down so he could get a proposal ready. Then he would make an appointment with them. If he, if he thought they qualified, he would make an appointment with them to come and see them. And he wanted, he told them, 
he told them right up front that um, he would make the appointment. He would want all the decision makers to be there, the husband and the wife, the wife and the husband. Uh, I and, told them to have their checkbook on the table because I'm coming I'm to do coming business. To that. And then he would say, <laughs> now I'm going to ask you to make a decision when I come there. Uh, it could be yes and it could be no. And no is an acceptable answer, but I am going to ask you to make a decision. And I want you to have your checkbook on the table in case you decide this is what's right for you. And then you talk about pushy, but positive, very positive. Now, he, they don't know they're talking to an 18-year-old kid. Yeah, it was easy to beat them up on the phone. Yeah, because they didn't know he was a tall, skinny, pimple-faced kid that just <laughs> didn't even finish high school. Uh, so he would go on the appointment. And when he would get there, he would remind him that, hey, you know, he makes sure the husband and wife was there together and the checkbook was on the table. And he would remind him, he said, now, Mr. Jones, do you remember that I, we talked about on the phone? I said I was going to make ask you to make a decision today. It would be yes or it would be no. And no is an acceptable answer, but I do want an answer. Now, you did say you would do that, right? And he would make him say yes, and then he would grab her hand, shake her hand and say, now, Mrs. Jones, you're my witness. He said yes. And then he would do his presentation, do his close. And no one believes me, so everybody thinks I'm on drugs. But Sean's closing ratio was over, over, over 100%. Well, how can you close over 100%? Because he would sell multiple policies. <laughs> he would sell my health insurance, some life insurance or something. But his closing ratio was over hundred percent. Well, but, I remember when that happened, it was actually, uh, I was pitching one couple and, and her sister happened to be at the house visiting. So we ended up selling two policies on the same deal. Policies. But, he but sold, you know, he sold everybody where he went and he sold multiple policies, but the back to the basics, Sean was talking about the three things, you know, uh, you got to have a product or a service there. We were selling insurance. We had to have a, 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 a way to get the word out there. Uh, what's, what's the second part of the three parts, Sean? The uh, you have to you had a marketing message. And, mark, and that was our sign. In other words, that's how we bring how do we bring new clients or leads into our sales funnel? That's our marketing that message. That was our sign. And the third our message thing, was lowest cost health insurance. Yep, yeah, lowest cost health insurance. It's a yeah. uh, pretty uh, benefit oriented, I would say. It was. It was. So, so could you use that strategy today? You think? I did it today. <laughs> there you go. I did it today. Uh, uh, you know, that's how I built my uh, my medical supply business at first, Seth. I, don't, I never told you that, but I did uh, bandit signs all around Indianapolis and Marion County. You see them all the time now saying, buy gold here. Buy gold here. Yeah. We buy cars. We clean gutters. We buy houses. You know. Uh, man, I've seen a good one today. It's, they're, they're all around here. It says, uh, the message is, uh, real estate investor needs apprentice. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about here in Indianapolis too. Yeah. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah, that one's pretty slick. Looks Backwards. like it's handwritten. Like looks like it's written with a with a number five marker. Well, these up here were pre, were silk screen. <laughs> I can put silk screen. I'll do silk screen. This looks like a guy did it on his kitchen table, but you know you can tell they were mass produced. But it's a pretty it's a powerful message. It's a, I put up a couple today, a couple yesterday. I got one that says uh, low cost. Here's a, let me put a commercial in on this webinar. <laughs> I hope so. Low cost, low cost health insurance or low cost dental insurance, $25 a month, 800-471-7915. 800-471-7915, low cost dental insurance. <laughs> toothless, toothless webinar attendees, call me. Um, I put up some, I got some in my car now, probably got 300 in the back seat of my car. And, uh, and a hammer and some nails. I would ask your website, but I'm afraid of the answer. www go to. I don't have no website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't you get the? Why don't you get your toll free number dot com? That'd be easy. I might. I'm thinking about giving up toll free number because nobody pays tolls anymore. It don't yeah. cost them to call anybody. We all got unlimited cell phones, so. So other than bandit signs and all your different endeavors, what would you say would be the most unusual type of marketing or a delivery system you've used and for what business? This is coming from a viewer, Ann. Uh, so if you want to answer Ann's question. What, give me the question one more time. 
Ann says, what is the most unusual type of marketing and or delivery system that you have used and for what business? So if, if you started every conversation with the words, did you get yours yet? What would happen? Oh, okay. I know what you're saying. Now I'm trying to answer the question for you because know, you're all right. All right. When Sean was before he was a tall, skinny, pimple faced kid. He was a short, skinny, pimple faced kid. He was 13. His brother was 14. And that's a great benchmark for figuring out how old things are. Yeah. <laughs> beat up on me. I'm 27. <laughs> well, back in the horse and buggy days, when he was a child, 13 years old, there was this company, you young geeks, you, what do you call them now? Millenniums? You millenniums? Um, you were That's Seth. I'm an X generation. Seth an X millennial. But there used to be a company called AT&T. American Telephone and Telegraph, abbreviated AT&T. What was unique about them, they had an exclusive monopoly, Google if you don't know what it means, a monopoly on long distance telephone calls. Uh, you guys don't even know what that means, long distance. I mean, we millennium, it's old term. But when Sean was 13, this great big humongous worldwide corporation had exclusive marketing monopoly on long distance calling long distance meant 20 miles down the road or 200 miles or 2000 miles you had to pay anywhere from 50 to 70 cents a minute a minute to call long distance that's why when people phone would ring they would say it's long distance that means hurry up and get your butt over here and get on this phone because the meter is running look at seth he can't relate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, too young. Before you were born, Seth, Indiana only had one area code. Yeah, Indiana did. Had 317, one area code. That was just cell phones. No, <laughs> cell phones, yeah. Now we have like 15 area codes in Indiana. Well, anyway, um, Mall Bell had an exclusive marketing long distance, and then it got challenged. This company came along called MCI. I forgot what the abbreviation for that was, but I used to know. But, but you can spell it. What's that? But you can spell it. Initial at MCI. I don't know what those stand for, but they challenged AT and T, which was also called. It had a nickname called Mall Bell, like Mall Bell. Tele it was Bell Telephone, AT and T. They were all cahoots together, monopoly. But MCI came along and challenged uh, Mall Bell, this big, humongous, multi-zillionaire giant, and they won in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declared Mall Bell monopoly and insisted that they break up into small companies and to let other people in the business. So that monopoly got broken up. MCI was a really uh, an innovator in doing that. And then all kinds of little companies started popping up. And this company popped up named U.S. Sprint. Some of you millennial geeks, you probably got Sprint phones. It all goes back to Sprint, you know. Uh, well, this company, Sprint, was one of them, and some genius uh, came up with a marketing plan. I won't tell you the negatives, I'll tell you the positives. Well, they hired people like me and others to market their long distance opportunities, and they were paying us a commission. So it was the, the product with the 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 sale was take the customer away from Mall Bell, which they had an exclusive on, give them cheaper long distance rates, and uh, they save money, and we got paid a commission on their phone bill. So I became a sales representative indirectly for US Sprint. Well, Sprint came up with this little slick idea, and I made it slicker. They came up with a look like a credit card, the size, the exact size of a credit card, and it said U.S. Sprint on there, and they gave you, now this was a big deal, it ain't nothing to you millennials now, but it was a big deal, 30 minutes worth of long distance free. Now that had a retail value of $15, if it was 50 cents a minute, figure it up. It might have been 75 cents a minute, but it was a lot of money, 15 bucks. Now we're talking, um, you know, like I said, when Sean was 13 years old. Well, what happened? This was a real shiny silver. 
And I learned this in the show business. In show business back when I was a kid, because I was in show business when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, until Scott was born. But a credit card about this size, and it was shiny silver. I mean, it was silver. That thing blinked. But back in my show business days, <laughs> I was that guy that worked in the game that said, hey, buddy, bring your cheerleader over here and let's win her this teddy bear. That was my job. And then I get them to play the game and hopefully win the teddy bear. But what I did to get people's attention, I learned this back in my show business days. If they stood in front of your tent or your trailer, I didn't have trailers back in them days, but if they stood in front of your tent, you could talk to them. That was your, that was your prospect. I don't want to give you the carnival names we had for them, but if they were <laughs> out in the, we called them a mark. <laughs> Thank you. This is no holds barred giveaway, Ray. Now tell us how you got the name. All right. <laughs> I'll tell you that later. But <laughs> out in the middle of the midway, out under the awnings of our tent, they were fair game to anybody. But if the man or woman is standing in the, under the awning of the tent next to you, it was an unwritten law from a showman. We can't talk to them. We can't talk to them at all. That's off limits. That's a taboo. But once they walked out of their awning, under your awning, he was fair game. He was your baby. And you had about three seconds to talk to them while they're walking under your awning before they got to the other guy's awning next door. So you better be doing your dog and pony show and get, get, get your marketing message down, abbreviate yeah. it and get it you out got, there. you got to get him over there now because once he left your tent, he was next door. But anyone out past the tents in the middle of the midway or standing over by the Ferris wheel or over by the merry-go-round, they was fair game to anybody. Well, my son gave me a name years ago and it, it probably does fit. You want to tell him what it is, Sean? <laughs> He calls me the mouth from the south because he calls me that all the time. The mouth from the south because I can get people's attention two or 300 feet away from me and without losing my voice. And when Sean does a special sale like we do a hands-on sale, he calls the mouth from the south because I don't get, if I get hoarse, which is, I can count on one hand how many times I've become hoarse. But when I do, I got a pocket full of money. I don't mind losing my voice for thousands of dollars. But uh, I've got a good delivery system. I do. Yeah. Well, I well, he, he horses around, and he's been known to be a horse's ass, but he doesn't get horse fare very I often. Not very often. But anyway, so what I would do with him, people standing over by the merry-go-round, I'd say, hey, buddy. I'd scream at him, and I'd get their <laughs> attention. And they'd look my way, and they'd look beside him like, who are you talking to, me? Yeah, you. I point to him. And then I'd have a business card, some piece of paper, something in my hand, a little thing like a credit card. We didn't have credit cards back in the horse and buggy days. You used to have a little piece of paper. I'd say, hey, did you get yours yet? And they'd say, what? They couldn't hear me totally or couldn't understand me. I'd say, did you get yours yet? And they'd say, like they had that question look on their face. <laughs> and then I'd, I'd take my hand like this. I motion for them to come to me and they start walking toward me. Now, if they quit walking toward me, I'd say, Hey, I get their attention again. Did you get yours yet? Now, what is that? That's one word, right? Did you get yours yet? Yeah, did you get yours yet? You had to say it all I can. Did you get yours yet? Well, anyway, they wonder what the heck I was waving at them. It's just a piece of paper. And I'd make them walk over, but I would break eye contact with them. And I still keep motioning them. And as they walk toward me, you know, I, I didn't make eye contact. Well, I look at them out of the side of my eye and uh, make sure they're still coming. If they quit coming, I'd yell at them again and say, did you get yours yet? Well, they would walk over and say, what did you say? And I'd say, did you get yours yet? And they'd say, get my what? Your free shot. You get to try my game free. <laughs> you know? Now, I got him up to my counter now. He's under my awning. Nobody can touch him. He's mine. And I would give him a free shot to throw the basketball or the football or the baseball or whatever game I was running. But that's how I got him over there. Now, move forward, many years forward. Here comes Sprint. Sprint's got this shiny little credit card. It's bright silver. I mean silver as you could get. Looks like a bar of silver. 
with the shape of a credit card. And with, what I did was I went in. It was know, a calling card, right? It was my calling card. That was my vehicle here. So as people, I got permission from Walmarts, Kmarts, Kroger's, high traffic retail stores to let me set a little card table outside and give away 30 minutes worth of free long distance for U.S. Sprint. That wasn't no jive. That wasn't a con. I was giving away a free card worth 30 minutes of long distance. Sprint was doing that. They were That was their bait to get people to join Sprint. We'll give you 30 minutes of free long distance calling if you'll try us as your long distance carrier. So as people walked into Walmart or Kmart or Kroger's or whatever, as they're walking, I'd say, hey, I had something really shiny. I'd say, hey, you know, watch the shiny copy. Did you get yours yet? And they would squint their eyes and say, what? Did you get yours yet? They'd walk over to that, do the motion. they walk over to the card table. And I'd say, they said, what's this about? I said, oh, well, it's your lucky day. I said, Sprint's giving away 30 minutes worth of free long distance. Now, that's like a gold mine. That's worth 15, 20 bucks. And it's what? like a tulip tree, like a yeah. gold mine in the sky. <laughs> so I'd say, you get yours yet? And then I'd say, well, well, get my one. I said, well, Sprint's giving away 30 minutes of free long distance for you to give them a try. So all you got to do is fill out this little paper right here with your name, your address, your telephone number, and we'll switch you from AT&T. And everybody already heard about AT&T get broke up. Man, this is like, this is low-hanging fruit, buddy. Woo! Man, I wish we had an opportunity like that today. Yeah. Well, it might not come around. Just going to keep looking. But um, anyway, just I just need you to okay it right here. And then I quit talking to him. Did the next one. Woo! Woo! Hey, you get yours in. You get yours in. Now, now, wait a minute. This this Carney right here had a little bit more hair back then in the 80s. But he had me and my 12-year-old brother out hustling phone cards in the foyer at Kroger. I remember like yesterday. Hey, did you get your jet? Hey, did you get your jet? Here, just okay this. And we get another one. And what happens when business, a crowd, I don't know how it's going to apply to you millennials on the internet, but a crowd draws a crowd physically. Like a fight. Um, fight. Millennials okay. on the internet get uh, what we call product reviews. That's how we stick the joint. You're talking Greek to me. So when, they, when you give the card away, then they would sign up with you? To I wouldn't give them the card. I'd show them the card because I couldn't give them away. They had to sign up for it. When they switched over, Sprint wouldn't literally send them a card. like I So was they wouldn't get it unless they switched. Oh, they reached for it. They would reach. They'd say, what? Let me see. Oh, yeah, come on. We'll touch it a minute, but we'd snatch it back. Hey, get yours yet. <laughs> well, I was trying to build a marketing sales organization. Now, this is where the fire, this is where we throw gas on the fire. Now, you, you folks may not believe me that it's humanly possible, but it is. We got three and four hundred customers a day to sign up for 30 minutes worth of free long distance. Three to four hundred a day. Now, I always try to duplicate myself, which is what you millennials need to do and whatever you can do, duplicate yourself smart. So I hired a bunch of people, a bunch of salespeople, because I might have got uh, 3% on everybody I signed up. I've, I got 3% of their long distance phone bill forever. And I could sign up a salesman and they got 3% and I get 1% off of their 3%. And so I started hiring a bunch of people and they all, you millennials will relate to this. We have a thing in the heart family. There's a word we don't allow in our vocabulary. I didn't allow my kids to say it. I don't allow my grandkids to say it. I've adopted a little bit, adapted for my grandkids, but we don't, what's the word we don't allow in our family, son? I can't remember. <laughs> the word can't. We don't allow that word can't. You, you millennials need to eliminate it from your vocabulary. It's the most debilitating, disabling, crippling word in the vocabulary, American English. Can't, because when you say you can't, you can't, because you mentally shut your brain down and you can't think past it because you can't do it. So, I, for one, can't forget looking for a stolen or lost gas cap in a 
and waist high weeds for about six hours on a hot Sunday afternoon in July. Because you said you can't find them. I said you could. I still can't. <laughs> I confess something to you. The statute of limitations is up now. I found the gas cap. I was just trying to teach you a lesson. <laughs> well, you taught me a lesson, not to abuse my kids, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you got my kids saying, I can't yet. <laughs> right. Now, with my grandkids, was Sean not spank his butt or his brother or sister? That's what he called it when he beat the crap out of you and send you to your room and make you clean the garage. Well, but my grandkids, yeah, they're pretty precious and innocent, so I don't beat them so hard. Um, I adapted that. You can say can't if you add a word after it. Can't yet. When one of my grandkids says can't, I said, what? You say, and they say, yeah, yeah, can't yet, can't yet. In other words, you haven't quit when you say yet. But when you say can't, you have quit. Well, anyway, back to the ranch. I uh, recruited a bunch of people. And, uh, well, they all give me the old can't. So, well, I can't sell nothing. I can't do that. I can't, can't, can't. And I said, sure you can. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send my 13-year-old kid out with you to show you how to do it. So I'd send Sean and his brother out. <laughs> with my recruits, they'd set up a coffee table in front of a Walmart or Kmart and boom, get your shit, get your shit, get your shit. Sean Shane was the best. Uh, Shane was, you know, I hadn't come out of my shell yet, but Shane, my brother, he was all over it. He loved it. He loved making the money. Yeah, he did. And uh, well, you caught on too, but them guys were out showing these recruits how to get three, 400 people a day. So what if you only got 100? That's a bunch. Yeah. You know, but if you did three or 400 on a good day, it happened. So I would send the recruits out with my kids. If it's easy enough for a 12, 13 year old kid to do it, I mean, you can do it. And I hired indirectly, I didn't do it, but I hired, this was a multi-level marketing company. Oh, uh, that's, the, that's the next buzzword. We don't allow that in our vocabulary either. Really, that's why I said, eh, gag me. And the reason I say gag me, because they screwed me. <laughs> like they're going to screw you if you get it. Um, but anyway, I had a 4,000. <laughs> the beauty of a, of a live broadcast. <laughs> I have, have 4,000 people in my downline. Now, I only had about 20 that I knew. I knew 20 people, my sisters and my brothers and neighbors. They never done nothing. But I got one good recruit that knew a lot of people and that person knew people that knew people that knew people. And I had a 4,000 person downline and I was making $18,000 a month in about seven months, a month off of them. And then all of a sudden the magical multi-level magic took place and somebody grabbed the money and ran and screwed everybody. We sued him, got a class action lawsuit seven, eight, 10 years later, we got a little settlement. But the bottom line is you had a product that everyone was using anyway. Yep. You just needed a better option. That's you had right. a marketing message. Did you get yours yet? Get yours yet? That's right. And your offer was 30 minutes free long distance to try us out. No strings attached. And your delivery system was awesome. I mean, you were out there in the trenches, shaking hands, kissing babies, or kissing yeah. kissing hands and shaking babies, however that goes. That's where you got your and, giveaway, right? No, no. Giveaway Ray goes back to show business days. When I Talk was about Giveaway Ray. <laughs> you know, you have to remember, I send out an email message and I throw all this content. And people oh. are like, what in the hell is a tulip tree? So now they got to know where <laughs> Giveaway Ray came from. Well, all right. Back in my showman days, I just worked for somebody for a long time. Matter of fact, I just saw him last night for night four last. Uh, he's 80 years old now. And I was like 13 when I worked for this dude. And then... I worked for him and worked for him and I made enough money that I bought my own carnival stuff and I had my own, I had half a dozen employees and anyway, um, there was this guy, his name was King Abdullah. Now for you Muslims, I don't mean to be offensive, but his name was King Abdullah. I can't, but I didn't name him, but, uh, he, uh, he was in the carnival <laughs> and, um, uh, he uh, had a little tags put on his uh, on his uh, stuffed toys, his teddy bears. I was one at King Abdullah's. I was one at King, and actually, 
No, Prince Abdul. Prince Abdul. He was a Persian prince. He really was in the bloodline, but he was a carny. Sure. And um, so I thought, man, that's a pretty clever idea. So I gave myself the name. I hadn't done anything yet, but I gave myself the name of Giveaway Ray. What happened was when I run my carnival games, um, the odds were against me to begin with. But if anybody ever complained, if anyone said, this game's a ripoff, man, I spent 10 bucks here, I ain't got nothing. Or I spent 20 bucks here. And I'd say, what? What do you mean a ripoff? And I'd just jump their butt like a fight. I was like, I'm ready to beat them up. I ain't never hurt nobody in my hands in my life, except my kids. I beat them up. But I would act like I was ready to fight. What do you mean call me a ripoff? This ain't no ripoff. I said, and I, I would raise my voice, the mouth from the south. I would raise my voice and cause a stink. And everybody thought there was going to be a fight. Has anybody ever been attracted to a fist fight? Sure, we all have. It draws the crowd. And I drew a crowd. Man, I start screaming. I'd embarrass that guy to pieces. I mean, he might be big enough to eat me. I never was a big guy. And, uh, man, I'd be jumping his butt and embarrassing him. You call me a ripoff. And then I'd take his girlfriend and say, Penny, if he won, which he ain't a very good sport, he can't throw a football very well, but he won a teddy bear, which one would you want? She said, well, I'd like that little blue one up there. And I said, this blue one right here? And then I'd give a big speech. I'd hold that to teddy bear up and say, folks, this little cheerleader here needs a good sportsman. Somebody want to be her boyfriend? This guy can't throw a football. She wants to win this teddy bear, and he thinks this is a ripoff. This ain't no ripoff. This is easy. You just got to have talent. And I'd make a big scene screaming, and then I'd give her the teddy bear. Man, oh. so much business coming in. Boom. Oh, that's got to be that's gotta be legitimate. He gave it to her anyway. And I think they're going to get one, too. But they ain't going to get one. They got to win. <laughs> or complain. Or, or complaints. I draw another crowd. But, so we talked about, uh, in one of my emails, I talked about your language. It says, Giveaway Ray even has his own language. What we call social proof, he calls sticking the joint. What we call making a sale, he calls chem to guilt. When we say work hard, he says door to door, store to store, floor to floor till there ain't no more. We say marketing, he says pitching, or what we call market research, he calls cruising and choosing. Care to elaborate on any of those phrases? Well, I could elaborate on all of them. You're not going to have them. <laughs> stick in the joint. Stick in the joint means that in showman terms, don't call me a carny. That sounds dirty. Uh, I'm a showman. Um, I'm obviously a showman. But uh, <laughs> stick in the joint man, in, the, in the showman terms, you, you've seen these games where they have a, like a 12 foot or 14 foot square box out in the middle of midway. You throw a ball in. If it lands on your collar, you win something crazy ball. Or we have mouses, little mouse games or rat games and different stuff. Well, stick in the joint. If it didn't look busy, you know how a crowd draws a crowd. Like I was just telling you about me giving giveaway Ray. Well, Carney showman, they will help each other out. They'll act like they're playing the game. Looks like they're not alone. Nobody wants to be the first kid on the block or the only kid on the block. So one or two show people will be out there playing the game. They're not really playing. It looks like they're playing. And it's, hey, we got two people. We need one more person on the speaker to come in. One more person. And so they would be playing the game. Dude, the crowd draws a crowd. Because like I said, nobody wants to be the only one. And what we do on internet marketing, we call it social proof. Uh, same scenario. No one wants to be the only one. No one wants to be the guinea pig or the first guy. So we have to we have to create a scenario that looks like you're one of many until we actually until it becomes a reality and we have we have uh, organic sales to go on. So same type of thing. We're still doing it in virtual reality. So I thought that was kind of fun to throw that out there. So how hard is it? make a sale without a product review or without somebody else thinking that it's been purchased before. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, what was your question, Seth? I'm sorry. I said, how hard is it to make a sale without a product review or, you know, some type of social proof? We just added uh, 
social proof to our website and you know today and the sales start coming in it's it's really powerful yeah it's funny this new website seth sends me a message today he's like wow we got our first sale you know and that first was an hour <laughs> after adding reviews to it yeah yeah so nobody wants to be the only one just like when we do a seminar or a podium pitch you know when it comes time to to ask for the order i always have a couple of guys out there the first one to stand up and ask for the order for them you know nobody wants to be the first guy so it still happens in, in virtual reality, just like it does in real life. And, and like Seth said, you know, as soon as he put, as soon as he got a couple of reviews up and started sending some traffic, we started making sales. So it still well, happens today. If any of you geeks or millennial, and when I say geek, I say that with due respect. I'm not putting you down. I just envy you. I wish I could be a geek. I got no geek blood in me. Uh, but if you've ever been exposed to a, timeshare condominium timeshare uh, vacation package program where you go to Cancun for spring break or somewhere and they say, Hey, we're going to give you a free dinner or a free boat ride. Free or, Disney tickets. Free Disney tickets. Do you still do Disney cruise? <laughs> well, there ain't nothing free in this world guys. So get over it. But if you've been, you'll relate to this. Now, wait a minute. We're providing valuable content right now. Free. Send me a check. I'm going to send you a bill. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, these uh, timeshare places, vacation packages places, they'll get you in a big room with 50 or 100 other couples or 50 or 25, whatever they can get in there. And then they'll stand, they'll be all, the salesman will be pressuring you to buy something. And then someone will stand up in the middle of the room and say, Attention, folks. They'll ring a bell. Hey, I want you to welcome our newest member to the to the vacation club. This is Bob and Susie Smith from Podunk, Michigan. Let's give them a big hand. Rah, rah, rah. And then a few minutes later, somebody else, oh, well, they're buying it. They're buying it. They're buying it. Why don't we buy it, honey? That that was uh, – they were sticking the joints, what they were doing. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing your uh, network marketing uh, since – since uh, multi-level is a cuss word now, network marketing guys, they, they have their juice meetings, just the acronym for join us in creating enthusiasm. Yeah. Like, no one here is enthusiastic, but if we all get together and, and uh, pretend to be enthusiastic, we all will be. Which well, uh, <laughs> I'm you, know, you know, my only, the only story I have to tell about quote unquote network marketing is when I, when you introduced me through this uh, legal service, I won't mention any names on there because I don't want to. I don't want to invite lawsuits, but I'm still the 18 year old tall, skinny, pimple faced kid. And I think this, this, this was a, uh, this was basically a contract or a monthly service that we were selling. So, uh, I go out there, kick ass for my first month and I sell one membership. And so I decide, Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to this juice meeting in Indianapolis and surround myself with about 300 uh, hyper entrepreneurs who are really just killing it so I can figure out what it is I'm doing wrong. So here we are. Yeah, this is God's honest truth, just as sure, just as, sure as a tulip tree. So I'm sitting there, the uh, corporate CEO of this big network marketing company comes on stage and he's giving his big horse and pony show talking about how great everybody is and how much money we're making. He says, uh, before we get started, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce you to our top producer of the month. Now, this guy's blah, 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 blah. And he gives this long bio about how this guy's really killing it, setting the world on fire. And, you know, to this day, I can almost guarantee you he didn't know the real numbers or he would have shut up. So this guy by the name of Wilburn, he was the CEO of the company at the time. He says, I want everybody to, to give a big round of applause to our top producer of last month. Would Mr. Sean Hart come up to the stage, please? And I'm looking around. I'm like, wow, that's weird. There's another Sean Hart in here. I'm looking, you know. The Sean me. One, one application. One. <laughs> Nobody stands up. So I'm thinking, surely he's not talking about me. Somebody's got their wires crossed. He said, is Sean Hart here today? And so my cousin was sitting next to me. He's like, that's you. That's you. Stand up. And everybody's like, is that you? I said, yeah, I guess that's me. So I stand up. And he says, come on up here. Let, let's talk a little bit about your business. So I'm walking up there trying to figure out what the hell this guy's so excited about because I sold one $39 deal. He's number one producer in the state. <laughs> yeah, so he hands me a microphone and says, now tell us a little bit about yourself and how you did it. And I'm like, how I did what? <laughs> how you sold your whatever it was. You know, I don't want to mention it by name, but 
In other words, he said, uh, what do you think about this opportunity and where the business is going? And, you know, I have to admit that I lied about it because I'm standing there looking at 400 people who are doing absolutely squat. If I sold one and I'm the number one guy, <laughs> everyone else out there must be sitting on a goose egg. So that was my experience, just as a little side note. I'm, I'm sorry made, to get off topic. They made him stick to joint. Yeah, I'm sticking to joint. I'm sitting here saying, yeah, I think this is a great opportunity. I think we're all going to make millions. Needless to say, I, uh, you know, I, I quit on my way home. I called <laughs> on the drive home. I said, "Look, I ain't doing nothing. I've done one, and they're all doing nothing." So he, he dropped out of it. Yeah, so I outsold them all. So I went home and called that quits, and figured that uh, you know anybody that's going to join a network marketing is basically mindless and lazy and can't can't come up with their own product or their own marketing message. So anyway, that's my two cents. So, uh, well, you millennials don't be careful with network marketing or MLM because. Usually, the, it's usually got a bad ending. So we warned you. Don't tell you we didn't warn you. Got a uh, got another question here for you, giveaway, Ray. How does old school sales differ from remote style marketing like we do? And, and how can we get, how can we use some of the same strategies in our business? You know, like we talked about sticking the joint. Well, yeah, you know, that's one good way. The, remember, I told you earlier, it's all about a numbers game. Find out how to get your product in the eyes and ears and mind as as many people as you can. If you can do that electronically or, you know, you guys are doing it electronically. You're trying to teach people how to make money on the internet. So that's out of my expertise. Sean, you would be able to address that more than me, but you know, whatever it takes to get hits, to get people to look at you, buying banner ads or placement ads, don't be afraid to spend money to make money. And how would you sell a product, um, maybe an online business, uh, you know, selling mattresses or something? How would you take it outside of the internet? How would you, you know, maybe would you sell a mattress through a, ban a bandit sign or something? What would you say about that? Are you asking me how to apply it to the internet? No. Oh, I'd outside of the internet. Take. How would you take an online product offline and use some of your old school yeah. showman techniques? Well, some of the things we've covered: bandit signs. Store to door, store to store, telephone, mass marketing. Um, some of you guys, uh, uh, is it okay to just let it all hang out here, Sean? Uh, yeah, I hope so. I have no edit button, so. Okay. Well, if you want to use, now see, I'm old school, but telephone, I know it's you guys like to text everything and email everything, but if you if you want to step out away from the internet and use telephone marketing, um, you can get a big bang for your buck if you use, if you outsource it to the Philippines. Now I know India does it too, but India has such heavy accents. In the Philippines, people there are friendly, they're honest, friendly, have great diction. I mean, they have better diction than you people do, than me. I just sound like a hick. They sound very, <laughs> very, uh, perfect English and there's only one way I could tell they're Filipino and that's because they're so polite they uh, are funny. super polite yes it's funny you know what's funny about you bringing that up right now is that for our online business we're actually right in the process of, of bringing on some virtual assistants in the Philippines to actually do outbound phone right. calls on the old mall bell type phone calling our customers and, and uh, interacting with them collecting email addresses and and offering coupons to go back online and order again. So, so that, that's kind of like a back end sale. You know, we already have the customer, but how would you get leads to call in the first place? Well, you can buy a lead. You can buy anything. You right. got money. But you want them qualified to buy your product. So would you normally collect your leads or would you buy them? If I was in your guys' position, I would buy, you can buy a qualified list. You can specify what you want. Uh, I'm just old school. I mean, you want to see my old school? I've probably got something in my pocket here. I see that. We have some door hangers or what? These are business cards that I stole off the bulletin board. Uh, today I was out cold calling door to door, store to store, floor to floor, till there is no more. But here's a, oh, I got a stack probably that thick in my car. This is great. I'm glad you brought this up. Let's Let's just paint a nice little scenario right here of our viewers of how, why you have a pocket full of business cards of advertisers. 
and, and we can talk about your current business and try to dissect that, which is what Seth wants to do. Well, um, I got my lazy butt up this morning. I'm not morning material like you, Sean, but I got up and I got started like Pappy at eight o'clock. I'm going down the road and I'm making phone calls. Now I'll, I'll tell you what I did recently. Now anybody gets rich on this, I get 10% or don't make me come and bust your kneecaps, but that's the car in the end. <laughs> <laughs> what I did the other day, I took a personal size envelope. Now you millennials don't, I heard Rush Limbaugh talking today about Thomas Jefferson. You millennials, people used to use an ink pen like <laughs> this. Here we go. Piece of paper and they would write a note on it. It was called a letter and they put it in a thing called an envelope and they licked the stamp and put it on there and they mailed it out to people. Thomas Jefferson did it way back in the horse and buggy day. But uh, <laughs> I did that last week. I took 25 business cards like this that I stole off a bolt of board somewhere or found at Home Depot or a drugstore. And I took a personal side, not a business side, just a size 10, which is about 10 inches long. And there's one about five or six inches long. A little Wait, size. What's that's that? 10 inches. What? <laughs> that's ten inches right there. Yeah, that. That's ten inches what for the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, we take a personal size Just envelope. In case you're watching, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we take a small piece of paper like this that you don't have to triple fold it to fit it in there. I mean, uh, I took a small piece of paper. Actually, I took an wrote two of them out on the on my internet on my word processor same message twice then i cut it in half and then i folded it a triple just triple fold boom, boom, boom. now here's what i did i hand wrote now you millennials listen to me you lazy butts don't type it don't let your computer print it don't stick a sticky envelope on it or a label on it hand write it Joe Jones, 1414 Pinnacle Lane, Podunk, Michigan, zip code, in handwriting. Either put nothing on the return on the return address. Nothing. Well, if you're going to put something, don't put ABC Corporation. Just put your return address if you want it on there, or your name, Joe Jones, Fred Jones, whatever. Or no put, laser print. Yeah, no laser print. Don't use any kind of technology. This is old school. It'll work, but no laser, no, everything by hand. You either put nothing on the return envelope, on the return address part. Uh, that's in the upper left-hand corner for you millennials that don't know what a letter is. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, handwrite it. So you're handwriting it because you I, want them to open it. I want them to open it. I swear to God, at my house, Sean probably does the same thing. At my house, if any envelope, any envelope, any size from anybody, if it's got, if it's in color ink, got any color, there's two colors, it gets thrown in the trash can. I don't open it. If it uh, is computer generated or digitally printed or whatever you millennials call it, it goes in the trash can. All it is is somebody trying to sell me something. I don't want to buy nothing. But I know you guys want to sell something, so I'm giving you a trick to the trade. Hand write to him. I know it's a pain in the butt. I know you could do a hundred of them on the computer faster than you could do one. But if you want them to read it, hand write it, put nothing on the return address or hand write it too. And no color. Black, 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 maybe blue, but black is best. And hand write it. If you can't write, get someone to do it for you. And then on the inside of the envelope, now you can print that if you want to. It would be best if you hand wrote it, but that's, that's asking you to do a lot. But I didn't hand write it, but I did something else to get their attention. When you open that envelope, my little bitty personal size envelope, which costs 80 of them for a dollar at the dollar store, that's pretty cheap. When they tear that envelope open, well, it must be somebody that knows me. They wrote my name. It didn't say Richard. It said Dick Smith. It didn't say... Uh, Joseph, it said Joe, you know, <laughs> so they open it up, pull out my piece of paper, which I want them to read. Now, 
if they see that it's, and it was written on my word processor or my printer, but I don't know. Word processor. I, well, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, he still has a fax machine, too. And, well, anyway, I put a dollar bill in there. A real green dollar bill. How do you like that coming full circle, Seth? Yeah. Stuffing <laughs> envelopes with dollars in, a, in Sean's print shop. Ten years ago. There you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thousands of them. He was the only guy I could trust with the cash. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I did it last week. So today at eight o'clock, when I did my pappy thing at eight o'clock, I'm driving down the road. Um, hey, hi, this is Ray Hart. Did you see that rotary phone he just dialed? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> anyway, uh, I'm on my iPhone. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, I'm calling the people and I say, hi, this is Ray Hart. Hey, the yeah, he used two hands to do his iPhone. What's that? <laughs> That's old school. You know, anybody over 50, they hold the phone and dial with the other finger. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I got a you, big iPhone plus now, son. I yeah, I know. I can't well, stretch across the whole screen. But well, anyway. If you, the shortcut, if you knew the shortcut, you could double tap the home button. But you send them the letter and then you call them after they got it. Call them out because... You know how many people I sent out twenty-five dollar bills with twenty-five letters. You know how many call me? Do tell. None. <laughs> but I how got, many remembered you? Well, I got twenty-five dollars invested here. I ain't gonna let it die. So I called in. Hi, I was calling you about the letter you received. You know, the one with the dollar in it. Oh yeah, yeah, that one. Wow, what's that all about? So did you read the letter? Well, I didn't really kind of understand it. So. Ooh, I, well, let me explain to you. So I, I got an appointment tomorrow off of it, off one of the calls. What, so what? wait a minute. Back up for just a second here. This is beautiful. I, I like how this. I like where this is going, and this is totally improv. Basically, your marketing message was a handwritten letter, and a, or I'm sorry, a processed letter, but a handwritten envelope. Yes. This is a beautiful delivery system because the fact that the envelope was handwritten in blue or black ink gets your prospect or your your uh, lead to actually open it. Yes. So basically we all know that we can have the greatest marketing message in the world, but if it falls on deaf ears or if, if I no one reads it, then it's almost uh, worthless. So the sure. fact that you used a handwritten envelope, old school, uh, got the letter past the first line of defense, past the secretary and the, and the receptionist into the business owner's hands and they opened it. That's 90% of the battle right there is just getting someone to put their eyes on your message. That's the right. Fact that you used what we call a dollar assured it when I called back, they remembered my letter. Right. Yeah, the, the dollar is what we call it. That's a grabber. The dollar made them read it. And then I got something to talk about when I call back because how many people get a dollar in the mail every day? You know? <laughs> exactly. Well, it grabs their attention and they immediately remember it. So just like you said, even if they didn't read it, it gives you, it gives you a foot in the door. So I so said classic. I another 25 with uh, uh, handwritten uh, for my low cost dental insurance, $25 a month, 800-471-7115. Um, <laughs> I got to call them tomorrow or whenever I get time. I'm doing that on a rainy day. But I, I hand wrote the envelopes out. It seems like a lot of your marketing successes came from, you know, your name, Giveaway Ray. You know, you're giving away the, the calling cards. You're giving away a dollar, basically, to capture the attention of the lead. And then you market to the manager. Well, Seth, you're a nice guy. No. <laughs> but I don't give nothing away. <laughs> right. There, there's well, a string. You're bringing them into your sales funnel. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, plus, uh, I think he understands the psychology of the old-fashioned uh, reciprocity. You know, just like when we're walking through Sam's Club and we're getting, I mean, how many times do you grab a free sample of a pizza roll or a roast beef sandwich and you feel guilty if you don't at least uh, read the back of the box and pretend like you're going to buy some, you know? And, right. and I think, uh, you know, some, if you give somebody something free, a calling card or a, or, or a teddy bear or, or even a dollar bill, you're at least going to, I mean, just human nature, they're going to give you at least the time of day to listen to you or acknowledge your existence. And that's all you can ask for. I mean, in such a busy world out there, I mean, people are exposed to thousands of marketing messages every single day. You have to have something to stand out, something to give you at least a foot in the door. And I think that's genius using, using the dollar bill letter. Um, I want to tell you something. You guys take this for what it's worth. And it, I think it has a, a big message here. This 
is a business card. And this is a free business card because it's from Vistaprint. But it don't end up being free because you got to pay four ninety five for shipping. But if you want it second day, you want a speedy, it's fourteen ninety five. And if you really want it rushed, it's nineteen ninety five. Now wait a minute, and that can't be fair. And there's no way in hell they would even think about sending you a marketing message after you're in their database, would they? Oh, would they wouldn't it? attempt to sell you a postcard or a letterhead or a magnet, would they? All drug on when you go to their website. <laughs> For only this much more, you can add this, and only this much more. And most people found this interesting. They bought this, bought this, and they bought this, and they bought this, and it takes you 15 minutes to get through that stupid website. <laughs> Shoot. But also, Vistaprint, if you want the freebie, cheapy, absolutely, it'll say on the back, free business card from Vistaprint.com. But you got to pay them to take that off of there to have a blank. So I know I recognize this card. This is a Vistaprint card. But he paid the extra four bucks, so it don't say business print on the back. And right. but now what I want to allude to that ain't got nothing to do with it. But Sean, you got a commercial one for Vista Print. Now um, these business cards, when I'm busy, like I went out and worked five hours yesterday, five hours a day, and I had to quit early because I had some other commitments. Uh, but I got a stack, a stack of business. My coat pocket can't hardly get nothing in my coat pocket, but these are now this is good for you millennials if you don't know this you're talking to an old time fart that's never had a real job i'll be 65 in a couple of days so i've been around i've never had a real paycheck it's always been commission commission nothing but commission this is a business this guy is called dr bob that surely it ain't his name diagnostic and electrical special oh yeah it's bobby pierce i'm dr bob <laughs> hey, yeah. he got his website on there this is a billboard. It's just a miniature billboard, but it's a billboard. And I know he believes in advertising because this is advertising. He's a tightwad. It probably costs two cents when he gets done with it or a penny, but he's also a potential candidate. He's an entrepreneur. If you want to recruit other people to sell your product, that's a good place to start. Here's another one. This is a H and H automotive and exhaust. I'm going to try selling insurance. Uh, <laughs> There's Glenn Sharpening Service, but they're out there forever. And my goodness, there's so many small business people out there. And then now a lot of them, I'll call. I've got some at home I've had for 10 years. I, I'm digging through trying to clean out my drawers and stuff. I call them, the number you dialed is no longer in service. Well, they went out of business. Well, why don't you recruit them to sell your product if you can? But it's a great source of advertising for me. And these are my leads. I'm going to call them. I'm old fashioned school. I'm, I'm a belly to belly, eyeball to eyeball, handshake to handshake salesman. And I don't know how to be a, a geek. I just don't know how. Sean's been trying to get me involved in this. And I keep saying I will someday, but I put it off. I'm just going to keep putting it off, I guess. But we can tell you're not at home using your own computer. No, we're using sales. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't get mine up. I couldn't get there in time today. I got delayed, and I wouldn't understood it anyway. But so, uh, when, when we, uh, how do you, when you go to look for a new product or service or a or a business opportunity? I mean, where do you look, and what are you looking for? Because you've been known to to change business cards about every thirty days or less. Yeah, so, I don't mean to start a business so I can save myself a fortune. They yeah. a social fortune. Yeah. What, what business are you in now? deal a day right but well, yeah. I actually uh i a handful of people that i know personally like to just call your phone once a month to see what your voicemail says this month <laughs> <laughs> you've reached you've reached b and b wholesale you've yeah. reached ray hart incorporated yeah. hello you're getting this message because you responded to a <laughs> it's there, man, because it's like you wear two or three hats uh, i like it <laughs> but anyway uh answering your question i'll kind of borrow it from you, Sean. I mean, believe it or not, you might be my son and you might have been one of my first and best students I ever had, but I'm your student now. I learned from you. And these guys watching this know you're a winner. Oh, um, man, he's going to ask for a big check now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm real proud of you, but I've observed you. Uh, I didn't know you used me for a guinea pig a few times. <laughs> and I did it. I just did it to make you happy and it worked out all right. But, 
um, you always said, find something people are buying now and paying a lot for it and give it to them at a better price. And then as you got successful, you got to kind of adopt and uh, change that theory, find something people are buying a lot of and make it available to them, but you don't necessarily have to give it to them cheaper. You might even give it to them more. Well, and, we've elaborated on that and said, uh, find something people are buying a lot of them, just give them a better option. Yeah. And yeah. now we've better narrowed option. it down to better, better option, some better benefit, better service, better service. Now, now that philosophy is totally abbreviated. It's sell people what the hell they want. Yeah, I like that. Um, so now Sean's never believed in over the years. You millennials that don't know him, I've known him since he was pooping yellow. So I was a long about, time. About 27 years ago? Yeah, about 40 years ago. Anyway, um, he uh, he's been through a lot. And he made a lot of money. He's lost a couple of times. He's won more than he's lost. I like to quote from some old Zig Ziglar stuff and some old day stuff. Babe Ruth, for you millennials don't know who that was, back in the old days, he was a, a candy bar giveaway, right? Oh, he was a famous baseball player. And he held world records for years and years and years. He played for the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, most of the New York Yankees. And uh, anyway... He had two world records. Everybody knows what one of them is. For you millennials that know who he is or baseball fans, you will know him. But everybody knows his first world record was he hit more home runs than anyone in Major League Baseball in his time. But most people don't know his second record. His second record, some people say smoking cigars and chasing women and drinking whiskey, but that's not the world record. They didn't keep statistics on that. But his second world record was he struck out more than any major league baseball player in his time. He had more home runs than anybody, but he also had more strikeouts than anybody. So he took more swings. He took more swings. And babe, the sports reporters used to ask him, they said, hey, babe, you struck out three times a day. What do you got to say about that? And old babe said, you can't hit them if you don't swing at them. And that applies to what you're doing, you millennials on the internet. You can't hit them if you don't swing them. So keep swinging. And you're going to connect to them. You might lose some deals. You might win some deals. You might lose some deals. But someday you'll hit your home runs. And uh, when old babe got a hold of that ball, though, it went out of the ballpark. He, he struck out a lot. But like you said, you can't hit them if you don't swing them. Yeah, uh, I think that says a lot. Actually, uh, my daughter Haley, you know, when she was playing basketball, she was always afraid to shoot. I actually yeah. gave her a business card I had. I had a, had a quote from Wayne Gretzky on the other side that said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Right. And she actually she put that card under the insole in her basketball shoes, and she and she uh, she yeah. lived by it for a few years. Yeah. Man, you she know only had like a 3%. <laughs> she only hit 3% of her shots in eighth grade, but, boy, she shot a lot. And she got really good with by shooting. Practice makes perfect. Um, Zig Ziglar said, and this will apply to what you're saying, sell people what they want. One of Zig Ziglar's, uh, he was a big guru in motivational speaking folks and sales motivation. But he said, to get out of life what you want out of life, you've got to ask yourself, you millennials and you people on the Internet watching this webinar, what do you want out of life? What do you want? Well, Zig told you how to get it. If you want to get out of life what you want out of life, you help enough other people get out of life what they want out of life, and you will get out of life what you want out of life. In other words, sell people what they want. Sell them what they need. You know, So help them get what they want. Like you just said, Sean, sell people what they want. What, yes. what they want to buy. Sell them what they want to buy, and then there's no battle. Yeah. So you don't have to con people and bullshit people and stuff like that. Just sell them what they want. Uh, you know, I'm speaking, I've spoke out of both sides of my mouth in my lifetime. Pre, my, <laughs> You're pre, kidding. In my 20s and my teenage years, it was just all about the money. Nothing but the money. Now, I still like the money, but like I said, after I started making little belt, putting people's names on, I found, you know what they like, sell what they want. They like to see their names sell. So it was easy to get. It was easier than screaming and having a big ride on the midway and you know, for the giveaway Ray routine, give them what they want. It's easier to get their money. 
And it says, uh, says the guy who taught me early on that a good salesman knows at least 10 different ways to tell the truth. You, you, you're lying. I told you five ways. You've expanded. <laughs> oh, you, okay. Yeah. I, said, I saw that off of Murphy's Law, a little cartoon in a thing called a newspaper. You young people probably don't know what a newspaper is. There used to be little cartoons, little figures. <laughs> Murphy's Law said a good salesman knows five different ways to tell the truth. I still got that cartoon in my desk. That's uh, funny. So it's it's good that you uh, that we come full circle here, where you take some of the philosophy and the and the systems and delivery systems that you used back in the in the seventies that still work today, because one of the the main things that uh, I was talking to Seth about today is that we all know that person who's made it big, and and lost it. You know, we all know we all know of a successful entrepreneur or, or a business owner of some kind who's made millions of dollars, but really doesn't have anything right now today. That doesn't mean that they're going to be broke forever. That just means that they're in between deals or whatever. And most of the time when, when you, when you talk about, you know, somebody that's lost that kind of money, the people who can't understand why that happens are people who's never made any money. And so that's what Seth and I were talking about the difference between money and, and wealth. You know, you got your typical guy who hits the lottery, makes millions of dollars, He's always broke within a year or two because he doesn't really know what to do with it and he has no marketable skill. Mike then you got the good example of that. Yeah, there you go. And then you got the guy who has a marketable skill, who the true wealth is is what he has between his between his ears because he can always go out there and make a living and, and create some type of value in the world to get paid for it. So um and you know what you what you've used over the years, what I've seen you do is basically just rehash you know, what worked 10 years ago, what worked five years ago, you just plug that into another business. That's really the essence of this entire webinar. And the reason why we're passionate about doing it is because, you know, like Seth said today, he said, I want to give people content that they can use immediately in their existing business to, to create more money, more sales. So have you ever been broke? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. You talking to me? Hey, yeah. You talking to me? Yeah. I wrote so, the book on broke, man. I know how to spell broke. That that's I funny. Broke. There's always a story about the guy that's given given the uh, the multi level marketing speech at the juice meeting, and in the background they're they're watching the the uh, repo man take his pull his Cadillac away. Yeah, you know, right. So if if you're in business or any type of entrepreneurial endeavor, and you, and you don't know anybody who's made it and lost it, I mean, a lot of people who don't understand that will sit back and make fun of that person because he's going through a hard time, but. For those of us that have been in that world, we know that the way that we live our lives and the chances that we take, there's always not only the possibility that we can make it big, but there's also always stand the possibility of losing it or, or making a bad investment or, you know, and spending it on the lifestyle that that, that we've grown accustomed to. So, Well, son, uh, I think you've heard me say this before, but just about one mile from where we're sitting right here, back about 1982, you were in the third grade, I think. I was in one of them broke situations. I was insurance, but I was having a rough time, and I was my head wasn't on right. It just wasn't on right, and I wasn't. My closing ratio was down. My bank account was down. I was down. I was depressed. I wasn't institutional material or Prozac material, but I was pretty bummed out. And in in sales, and you guys are in sales. You call it network marketing or internet marketing, but still sales. There's feast and there's family. Some days you eat the bear, some days the berry chew, some days you're the bug, some days you're the windshield, but they're coming. <laughs> Good success. But I'll tell you a marquee that changed my life immediately. It's Walker Insurance. You know where it's at, don't you, Sean? I do. Right over, you never go by it on Washington Street? Probably. It's right across from where Walmart or Kmart used to be. Thornton. That's Washington with an R, Seth, by the way. <laughs> okay, he had always about me on my Washington, Washington. Anyway, on Washington Street, Walker Insurance, about every week he puts up some little cliche, some little old saying, some little poem, some little catchy phrase on his marquee. Boy, did I need it this day. I drove by there. I always look at it. Still to this day, I look at it every day. For drive by there. Every I look at it too, thanks to you planting that seed. You know where I'm going with this. And that's that one little saying up there said, success is, are you listening, millennials? You geeks, 
You want to know what success is? You want to know what it is? I'm going to tell you what it is. I read it on the marquee, mile from here. <laughs> That's it. When you ever see that word, it makes you want to read it. What is success? I want to be successful. You want to be successful? Well, here's how it told me to be successful. Here I am, bummed out, broke, depressed. And that marquee said, success is getting up just one more time than you fall. Ta-da! End of quote. Success is getting up just one more time than you fall. Because you're going to fall sometimes. Don't get depressed. Just get back up and get going. You yeah, keep that. swinging, just like the babe. Keep swinging. Just take I remember uh, that marquee one time said something to the effect of uh, – sometimes the only taste of success that others will get is when they take a bite out of you or something like that. And uh, I think that originally came from Zig Ziglar speaking of him. But, yeah, there's always something witty up there. After 40 years, I went back, 38 years, I went back over there and I stopped there last year to meet Mr. Walker. He's retired. He's about 91 years old now. His son or grandson runs the business. But he comes in about once a week to change that marquee. I begged him. I said, man, why don't you put all those cliches in a book? Put it on the internet. Put it in a paper. I'll buy it. I'll buy advanced copies. I'd love to buy them to give, give them away. He's so motivating. He's so positive. Another little food for thought. This is kind of off the productive scale. But it, I'll never forget about a year or two ago, it, one of them said, it said, um, um, it said, the best things in life are not things. That's my good. son's a good example. Of, he's a good father. Good Best things in life are not things. They're people, you know, they're well they're back stuff. back on track when it comes to, you know, the way I like to compare poor versus broke. Um, like we talked about, we've all we all know a businessman or somebody who's been been uh, through the ringer, uh, had a bad deal, lost money, anybody that invested in real estate in two thousand eight or so on, but you know, the fact that, you know, someone is poor uh, for example, has no money and no skills to make any money and don't know where to get any money. That's a bad situation to be in. But most of the people that, that I'm that are in my network or you guys know, if they're broke, that just means that today they don't have any money, but they definitely still have the skills to make money. And they may be temporarily broke, but they'll always bounce back and, and could make as much money as they could possibly need to spend because of that marketable skill. So what I'd like to do is, is present a lot of opportunity and a lot of skill that people can gain and knowledge from this webinar that they can use to build value in their business and in their life and, and hopefully change the way they do things. I mean, even though prime example, I've been writing, writing sales copy in a form of whether it be a, a sign selling roses on the street or, or a newspaper ad, I've been writing successful sales copy and generating revenue for over 10 years, 15 years. And, you know, I just recently uh, purchased a, a, a copy program uh, just to help with, with my sales pitch that I've been writing. And I learned one little, one small grain of, of knowledge in that, in that program that totally changed the way that I priced a current product. I mean, I made money with it immediately. So if we focus on, on adding ammunition to our, to our knowledge of, of business and marketing, then that's something that's going to pay off a thousand fold over time. You know, so I think that people should spend their time gaining that knowledge and, and being able to implement it as time goes on. You know, there's a difference. If you're if you're poor and helpless, you have no money and you got no way to make money, that's a bad situation. The only way to dig your way out of that hole is to is to gain knowledge and understanding about business and marketing because like Ray here, he could be flat broke today, but there's you know, like he always said, salesmen are what makes the world go around. And there's there, I mean, he can walk right down the road and, and, and find a job selling anybody's product, especially if he's willing to do it on commission. I mean, Seth would hire him today to go out there and sell a mattress, obviously, because he just asked him about it. So, but those skills and those things that you've acquired over the last, you know, 50 years or so, uh, running around uh, peddling your wares is something that, you know, people can't buy. You can't learn that in school. You can't inherit it. You can't inject it. It's, it's comes from good old fashioned, trial and error and, and getting your face kicked in. And I think that's important for people to understand. Well, you know, this is a happy life. If, if, you, if you guys don't know it and you haven't read it, 
It's a thing called a book. It's made out of paper <laughs> pages. But you can get it online now. I'm sure it's available on YouTube. But Sean will tell you, other than the Bible, our favorite book in the whole world. You want to tell them what it is, Sean? Yeah, I hate to put that out there. I'll make them ask for it. If you want to know, email me. You should because, ask. Uh, it's something that if you give it away freely, people don't really value it too much. Yeah, you better ask for it, guys. I know what it is. <laughs> you know what it is. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, there's little stories in this book about how to be successful and stuff like that. But it's going to be a fun life. But in that book, one of the things it quotes is that the profession you have chosen, I'm a salesman. You guys are too. You're just electronic salesmen. You're some kind of weirdo geeks, but you're selling. <laughs> I love that. And uh, but, I'm being called a geek, Seth. That's that's amazing. Well, anyway, it's a. It says the the profession we've chosen is a lonely one. Not everybody's going to relate to you. When you go tell your wife or your husband or your next door neighbor or your dad, your mom, your Sunday school teacher that. Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm selling on the Amazon. I'm selling on the river. I'm selling, selling, selling. And they're going to say, what? Are you crazy? I tried to sell before when I was in college. I tried to sell magazines in college. I lost my butt. You're going to lose your butt too. That's what they're going to tell you. Those are called SNEOPs, according to old Zig Ziglar. SNEOPs is when you get subject to the negative influences of other people. <laughs> They neg you out. You don't want to hear all that negative crap. Take a chance. Roll the dice. And I'm going to tell one story about Sean. I love talking about him. I'm so proud of him. Great. Can I, Sean, tell him about Ty Green? <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Go ahead. All right. It's a true story. Sean listens. He always listens. Now I listen because he's a teacher. He's smarter than me now. Don't tell him I said that. But anyway, there's a guy named Todd Green. Sean knows the story better than I, because he was there. And I heard rumors of this guy that he was a very wealthy man, an entrepreneur. Now, he started a business in his parents at his parents' house when he was, what, 16, Sean? He started in, and he started in his bathroom or the, their garage, and he started buying little trinkets, like from China. This is before the Internet, way before the Internet. But you talk about putting gas on the fire. He went and bought these little trinkets, which were cost pennies, eat pennies, not dollars and pennies, pennies. Junk, junk, China, junk. And he hooked up with some convenience stores. Any place that would listen to him, he would say, hey, let me put my junk up here by your cash register, and we're going to sell it for this. And I'm going to sp split the profit with you. All you're giving up is a little space on your shelf here, on your counter. I'm putting up the product, and we're going to split it. And it turned out pretty good. So they gave him referrals to other people. And boo -doo, boo -doo, and it just grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And he made millions. And then I saw where Sean was going with his entrepreneurial spirit. So I... Out of the clear blue sky, this guy named Todd Green that's doing this stuff. He's got, now this was back when Sean was a teenager, many moons ago. I got an audience with Mr. Green. He was kind enough to give us an audience. I asked him if he could spare an hour to help an upcoming young man teach him a little bit about business. He graciously gave us an hour of his time. And he told Sean his story. I was there with him. He told him his story. Sean always listened because he's a very good listener, folks, and he's a multitasker, but he was a good listener, and he listened to Mr. Green. He asked a couple intelligent questions, but mostly he was there to listen and learn, which he did. And when we excused ourselves, we shook hands with him, thanked him for his time. We were on the way out the door, and he goes, Sean, one last thing. Remember what it was? Tell him what I told you, what he told you, Sean. I remember what it was. He said, don't ever be afraid to put your balls on the line. On the table. He said on the table. Don't be afraid to put your balls on the table. And that was back in the old days when you couldn't order Chinese stuff over the internet. You actually had to go there and, and shake hands. And, I have a middleman in between you to mark it up. 
but yeah. that, that company today is is uh, it's probably half a billion or yeah, half a billion dollar a year company out of Greenfield. It's called Novelty Inc. Look it up. Every day. Yep. 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 So. That's from. But he yeah. told me, you know, don't be afraid to put your balls on the table. Now, sometimes people cut your, we say, in this case there's ladies listening or gentlemen, I apologize for that nasty language, but they will, sometimes you'll get your gonads cut off. And when you do, grow another pair and get going. Keep swinging. Don't get exactly. up on the spot. But Sean's done that. He's always put it on the line. And uh, you guys can learn a lot from Sean, an awful lot. And he, he, he's a student, too. You can teach him things. Well, that's what this is all about. We're networking, teaching each other stuff. I may not be able to give you anything, but I can give you some advice with a lot of experience. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to take a gamble. Because, you know, when I'm out selling, you know more people tell me no than tell me yes. You don't say. Really? Do you know how many business cards I've estimated I've went through in my lifetime? <laughs> at least, I'm being conservative. You're going to think I'm on drugs. But at least at 20,000, passed out 20,000 business cards. You know how many people called me back when I left them the card? Let's see. You see these fingers? Well, I don't need the thumbs. And you see this hand? I don't need this hand. That's how many people probably call me back. And it's usually probably complain about something. <laughs> they tell you to take your damn bandit sign down, maybe. <laughs> yeah, they've complained about that. And uh, I just play dummy on it. You know, I say, well, where's that? I'll come and get it. And then I never go get it. You know, move it up there. That's but, funny. Yeah, there's a lot to learn. You know, keep swinging. It's all a numbers game. There's nothing new under the sun. It says that in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Nothing new under the sun. You know, I mean, yeah. just a different twist to it, maybe painting it a different color or something. Um, one of our, when we were young people, and Sean showed you in the last webinar, he was real proud of that. That old van, that yellow van that said, roses, $6 a dozen. <laughs> Well, we had a friend. We met a friend, a competitor. We ended up doing business with him a lot. He became a friend. He's a nice guy. And, and uh, you know who I'm talking about, Sean. And we'll give a little kudos to him. But um, anyway, uh, he taught us one thing in one sentence. Now, remember, he's a roadside vendor, sitting like Sean did with a van. And he sold roses for five, six bucks a dozen in carnations. Still doing it today. I bet he'll be out there this weekend. He's probably 70 years old. I bet he'll be out there now. He did it 40, 50 years ago. Um, anyway, his name was Sam Holmes. Great man, super gentleman, and just a common good old boy. Made millions selling flowers. Still doing it. But Sam took us aside one day. And what we did, we'd sit on a street corner. And now there's a lesson to be learned here. We sit on a street corner on the roadside somewhere. And Sam taught us one thing, and Sean will verify this. He said, you know, what do you do when business is bad, Sam? You know, we'd pick a bad corner, a bad location or something. Sam said, one dollar and one mile can make a world of difference. In other words, if you're having a bad time, start your van up and drive a mile away and drop your price a dollar or raise it a dollar. That can make a world of difference. So be adaptable. Be ready for change. Be ready for change. You know, See that? if you get complacent in that favorite book of ours, which you need to ask Sean about, there you go. <laughs> That's it. Um, I'd love to find that thing in a junkyard somewhere. I'd drag it home. I got his first, I got your first trailer, Sean. You paid 50 bucks for it. Can I tell a story about you? No. Crying? Don't, Don't lie. You lied, big cry, baby. Yeah, believe it or not, I actually have an agenda here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, there's the van that was called the uh, Chateau Lafitte. You know, we used to give them all a name. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Sam said, you know, change, you know, one mile, one dollar make a world of difference. And that was, a, he said, everything he could teach us right there. So you yeah. guys be ready to change, be ready to adapt. You know, the internet may, may be old school in another decade. It, it may be the way of the dial telephone, you know, 10 years from now. We have mind control. You wear little helmets and we don't talk. I took Sean's daughter. She asked me, Grandpa, will you take me over to my boyfriend's? I left my book over there. So I took her over there. 
We pulled up in the drive. What's up? Go up to get your mug. We're here. She goes, he's on Texas. No, he's bringing it out. <laughs> he come over to spend the afternoon with her over at our house. So we had lunch. and So they're sitting on each side of the couch. They're texting. I said, I thought you guys were going to spend a little time together. Talk together. I said, well, we are. <laughs> You're texting. texting. Each other. What about your vocal cords? Hello? Uh, no, we just don't want you to know what we're saying. <laughs> and, That's funny. You know, so the next generation, think about change. You guys won't have vocal cords. Your kids won't have no vocal cords. They don't talk. They text or the internet or they email. And they won't have thumbprints because they wore them off from generations from texting. So no fingerprints, no vocal cords. Be ready for change is what I'm getting. Now we're going to wear little think helmets. And uh, <laughs> we have the thought, I want to order from there. You know, Give we, away Ray, the, the visionary. <laughs> the FedEx will be ringing your doorbell because you had a thought, you know. Or like FedEx will be hoovering around on Hoover machines. Don't have wheels on trucks no more. <laughs> you might be able to digitize it and send it to you through a, through a thought process and then you have a brain fart and there it develops in your living room what you want. I think, uh, he just had a Jim Cramer moment. Let me let me interject something here. So, you know, basically what I'm trying to get at here is if, if you've just obtained knowledge and sales and marketing, then you can always write your own ticket. You'll never be you'll never be unemployed or never be jobless or without an idea to make money. Nope. And that's what no such thing as an unemployed salesman or an entrepreneur. So before I close, tell me the story about the two vultures in the desert. <laughs> Bill love this one. All right. I gotta set this up real quick. I'll be quick. There's two. I got this poster it's in my story somewhere. And you can get it on the internet. But there's two vultures sitting on an old dead log out in the middle of the desert. Now they've been having a conversation. They're both little skinny, scrawny looking, scraggly looking vultures. They're ugly anyway, but they were these were extra ugly. And they're hungry. And they've been having a conversation. And you just kind of got to read between the lines of what, what the conversation was. It's not in the cartoon or the poster. But it says, one is telling the other one, you know, I just quit complaining. I know you're hungry, but something will die pretty soon. And if it dies, we'll eat the carcass. Well, that's what you assume they said. That's what was the unsaid word. But what's said in the caption in the cartoon, one looks at the other one and says, Patience, my ass, let's kill something. So that's what you need to have as a salesperson, entrepreneur, or an internet geek that you're selling. You know, kill something. Get busy. Get active. Get your ass up and get going. I use this terminology for years. The hardest door, this is for me, but it'll apply to you too. The hardest door for me to open is my own door at my own house to get my ass out and go to work. The next hardest door to open is my car door to get my ass out of bed and go talk to somebody. The same with you. Get your ass out of bed. Don't stay up all night on the internet. Get some rest and get a fresh start and get busy. Get active because it's all a numbers game. Activity will break. There it is. <laughs> yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it, millennial. <laughs> yeah, you geeks. That's funny. Uh, so, you know, uh, we've had a pretty good conversation there and I haven't really give Seth any, uh, any space to ask any questions. Well, I was going to ask you, you know, you kind of, uh, hinted at it, but I don't even know it. I don't think what was the, uh, the little trick you learned on your new copywriting program. Oh yeah. It was, it was simple, uh, strategy of price stacking of how to, how to price uh, your product three different levels. So to make the, uh, the, the highest price package or whatever uh, present as the most as a most right. obvious option and i just used that on a recent product i mean and we went from selling that that item from 279 dollars 100 percent of the time to 479 dollars yeah it's pretty ridiculous i think i paid 200 bucks for the course <laughs> i put it on your company card so you'll get the bill oh thanks <laughs> you're welcome you remember, you know, uh, before before we take off out of here, there's something you have to keep in mind when it comes to you know being in business for yourself, making your own way, creating your own your own job, creating your own wealth, and and uh, you know, very very seldom, if not 
ever will you see a wolf considering the opinions of sheep. It's a good idea. <laughs> Never. I mean, uh, you think a wolf cares what a sheep thinks about him? Never. And you know, you got you got to keep that in mind when you go out there into a new marketplace or a new product or a new business venture and just just tackle. I mean, just take it head on and and tackle the project and and own it. I mean, that's you know, when you talk about putting your balls on the table like Todd told me to do at 16 years old, I mean, uh, if if you burn your ship, you got no way to you got no way to leave. You burn the bridge, you can't escape. You have to win. And I've done it several times. We'll talk about pantyhose and sandpaper on another day. <laughs> Seth, uh, say we, something before he tells a story. <laughs> we, we have to close this thing up. We're two hours into it. All right. Well, Andy owes the sea of paper. I've heard that story before. Yeah, it's a true story. I've never seen that boy work so hard in my life. Sean always went to bed at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. He was zonked out. He stayed up all night. Calling the West Coast because they had a different time zone. He was burning the clock at both ends. Yeah, he got her done. That's funny. So anything you want to say in closing, Seth? Uh, you putting me on the spot, Sean. Not really. <laughs> I always do. I figured Thank you'd be you. taking notes. Well, thanks for spending a couple hours with us, Dad. I hope you had a good time. I uh, you. love sharing with you young people. I wish you all success. Just remember, keep on the swing. You can't hit them if you don't swing at them. And, uh, you know, you're going to hear more no's and get more rejections. And yes, you have to fail often to succeed only once. You may, now hopefully you're all successful, but sometimes you'll fail off and see once. You're not a failure. It's that incident didn't work. Think of a better idea. Think of a better mousetrap. Package it a little different. Move one mile away and raise the price. Sean's done that a lot. You know, when you tell Sean your problem, some of you guys have heard this. You know what he'll tell you? Well, I can't make enough sales. He'll say, raise the price. Has anyone ever, has he ever told any of you guys that? He'll say, well, raise the price. There's, it sounds insane, but it works. He's done it. He's made money at it. And if you get real busy and you're so busy, you just can't catch up. Your sales are so busy and you say, oh, I don't have any time. Raise your price. You know, you'll make more profit with less time, less inventory, less shipping, less everything. Raise the price. And then when it quits selling, then you can lower it a little bit until it starts yeah. Now, but I love it. It drives me insane to watch somebody sell the same product for 20 years at the same price. I mean, I just had this conversation. The guy's on the webinar right now. Um, won't mention any names, but we're actually going to have him on as a guest pretty soon. And he says, well, what about this? And what about that? I was like, you know, I gave him the pricing strategy. I said, here's what, here's a couple things you can do to get your price up. Um, I mean, it just, it drives me crazy. Somebody says, well, I've been selling it that way for 10 years. They've never even tested it. Just because it worked the first time doesn't mean that you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head and got the perfect price for the market. I mean, Seth adjusts price every day. We just took one of our best-selling products and moved it from $20 to $40, and sales fell off enough to where we had to readjust it. But finally, we end up selling it for $30, and our sales are staying pretty much on par with what they were at $20. Is that and right, Seth? Less shipping and less right. handling. Yeah, we've had lots of experience with tripling a price and selling more. Yeah, selling more units. You hear that? Triple the price and sell more units. Hello, yeah. pay attention, my little else. These guys yeah, are smart. exactly. It's it's about value. If the value's there, then you know a lot of times the price is irrelevant, or a higher price product will actually position you as more of a authority or more of the better quality in the market. And it could be the exact same product. I mean, uh, just like I told you when when you and your business partner were talking about your advertising company. And you say, well, what about this? And, you know, I kept saying, it's just too cheap. It's worth more than, what, $350 or whatever you're selling it for. Yeah, right. So you got to play with the price. You know, if, if you spend if you spend a, a whole year selling selling 1,000 widgets and uh, you're shorting yourself, you sell them for $20 when the market will really pay $50, the sooner you can learn that lesson, the better off everybody's going to be. Who's the people on this webinar? Who are they, Sean? Are they just uh, friends, network friends? Are they business uh, or both? We created kind of a list over the last year or so, just uh, you know, doing some Amazon training and things like that. Friends of friends, uh, business people, entrepreneurs, and other marketers. Uh, basically, just trying to create a forum there where people can share their experience and, like I said before, hopefully plug in something that they learn here into their existing business to better their sales. You know, whether that's raise your price by $2 today 
or, you know, hanging bandit signs all over and pissing off the utility companies. Hopefully you get something from here that you can use. So I've said enough. I'm, I'm ready to sign off, gentlemen. I appreciate you uh, spending two hours and 10 minutes with us. And uh, we'll be happy to have you back on again, give away Ray, so we can actually dissect your advertising business, which we didn't have time to get into tonight. But another time, another place. All right. Guys, enjoy it. Good night, everybody. That's yeah. Japanese for you folks that don't know. <laughs> Good night. See you.